As we come and meet in God's house, no better place to be than God's house any time of the year, amen? Well, a little boy, he was 10 years old, and he made a call to the local hardware store. And the owner of the hardware store answered, and the little boy said, uh, yes, I was wondering if you wanted to hire somebody to sweep in front of your store, uh, clean your windows, clean the aisles in the store, kind of spruce up back there at the loading dock and uh, clean the flower beds in front of the hardware store. Well, the owner of the store said, well, thank you, young man. I uh, said, appreciate you asking, but we already have a, a young boy that does that. His name's Johnny, and he does a fantastic job of doing all those things, and we couldn't even dare think of ever replacing him because he does so well. The little boy on the other end said, well, I know this is Johnny. And the owner said, well, Johnny, why on earth would you be calling? He said, well, I always think it's good every now and then to check up on yourself. <laughs> you know, I think this last Sunday of the year, I think it'd be pretty good for us to check up on ourselves. Because a lot of times we just have a tendency to think we're all right. Sometimes we think we're all right physically until a doctor tells us otherwise because we went to the doctor for a checkup. And sometimes we're that way spiritually until we take time to check out just how are we doing. And so this morning the sermon is when your spiritual get up and go has got up and went. Because no matter how long you've been saved, You've gone through times maybe where your spiritual life just, just needs a little spark, what we may call a revival. You know, you do that way physically, don't you? Isn't there sometimes in your physical life you just don't feel as good as you once did? You feel like, man, if I could just feel a little more energy, I'd be all right physically. Well, it's the same way spiritually. Now, some people never get a spiritual get up and go because their spiritual get up and goes never got up and went because they've never been saved. But once you've been saved, you've got that spark. You've, got, you've been born again. That means your spirit is alive. But even once it's alive, we do go through periods in our, time, our life to say, you know, I just need to get more on fire for the Lord. And you wonder, how do I get that to happen? Do you just say, okay, spirit, get going? Well, no more than you tell your physical body, well, let's get going. There's some things you've got to do. There's some things to focus on. And I think Luke 7, 36 through 48, I believe, gives us the answer to that dilemma. If you face that this morning, that I just need a little spiritual revival in my soul. How can I, how can I get it cranking up? <clears throat> well, the first thing we're looking at in this story is the setting. This story begins in verse 36. And it said, now one of the Pharisees was requesting him, that's Jesus, to dine with him, and he entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. Now, in verse 40, we'll find out that this Pharisee's given a name, and his name is Simon. Not to be confused with Simon Peter, but Simon the Pharisee. And so we are given direct information to know whose house this is. And this Pharisee has invited Jesus to come and dine with him. And you can see how dining took place back then. You reclined at the table. You didn't sit at the table. You know how your parents always say, sit up straight and don't slouch and whatever. Well, back then you got to kind of lay down and eat. Eating and laying down at the same time. We should adopt a little Israel culture, amen? Because that's a good way to eat, relax and lay down. And so he's got Jesus at his table and he's dining and this Pharisee is... Uh, having Jesus. Now, we don't know the reason he invited him. Uh, the story, the Bible doesn't tell us that. So we're not even going to speculate on why he invited him. Other people we can see tried to trick Jesus, and that may or may not have been Simon's motive for inviting him. And then we've got the sinner. The sinner, verse 37. And there was a woman in the city who was a sinner. And when she learned that he, that's Jesus, was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house. So she shows up. Matter of fact, later on, the owner of the home, Simon, 
he even says, she is a sinner. So not only does the story tell us she is a sinner, the owner of the house points her out later on in this passage and says, she's a sinner. Wow. This woman's name's never given. We don't know what her name is. And we don't know her profession. But we can hasten to say, as many do, that more than likely, she was a prostitute. Selling her body, living that immoral lifestyle, and may again, that may be why the people that were there could quickly identify her as a sinner because of how open her immoral lifestyle was. So what was she doing at this party of a religious leader, a Pharisee, and Jesus and other guests? Well, obviously we know she wasn't invited. No Pharisee would ever invite since they felt like they were such high standing in society. They would never, ever even consider inviting somebody that they would consider of such low standing. So how'd she get there? Well, back in this time when there was dignitaries, famous people, people that were of high standard and dignity and things, when they had a party, people in the community wanted to come hear what they had to say so you could come into the house and just kind of observe the conversation, watch the people eating the meal, and glean some things for those that spoke at a gathering. So they were kind of open invitation, so to speak for people to come and hear. And when she found out through somebody that Jesus was gonna be there, she made sure she wanted to be there. So she came obviously very uninvited and probably very much out of her comfort zone. These were not the people she would be running with. These would not be the people she would be fellowshipping with. These are not people she'd be going out to eat with. These be people that would only know her for her immorality. Matter of fact, I believe, as some do, that maybe she got saved even before this event. Jesus ends up saying in verse 48, your sins have been forgiven. Some believe she got saved during this event. I just have a feeling that maybe she was saved before this event. And this event is an outpour of her gratitude of already being saved because we know that what she does in this passage does not earn her salvation because nothing that any of us do earn our salvation. It's not by works, lest any man should boast. That if she did get saved during this event, it was just also out of gratitude that she's doing what she's doing. So I believe that possible possibility that if you look at the harmony of the gospels, that is, uh, there's books that's written that harmonizes Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John because all of them give particular passages and stories in each of them. But if you harmonize them, the event that occurs before this event is the last part of Matthew 11. The last part of Matthew 11 stops and then Luke 7 is really what begins the next event. So you say, what happened in Matthew 11? That's where Jesus gives that great invitation that says this, come unto me, all you who are weak, and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Well, that's the invitation for all of us to come to salvation, isn't it? You want rest for your souls? You want to worry about going to hell? You want your sins to be forgiven? You want to rest in all of that? If you're weak and you're downtrodden, you're desperate and you're seeking answers, come unto me, and I will give you rest. So I believe it may have been at that event that she was in that crowd, and she said, boy, do I want rest. Boy, would I love to be forgiven of all these sins that I've committed. And it may be there that she turned her life over to the Lord and gave him her life. You know, the next thing indicates the sacrifice that was made. Luke 7, 37 says, She brought an alabaster vial of perfume, and standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and kept wiping them with the hair of her head and kissing his feet and anointing them with the perfume. Remember, he's reclining. He's got his head and hands up there where the food are, and his feet are kind of lounged out, laying down beside him. And she would not even much dare come to his head or his eyes. She was so humble, she would only approach him at his feet down on the other end. 
And she goes down there to his feet, standing there, and something begins to happen. She starts crying, weeping. Matter of fact, it says she began to wet his feet. If you study that word wet, it's a Greek word and it kind of carries a connotation to wet like with rain. She wasn't kind of how some people do. You say, you know, I noticed you got a tear rolling down your cheek. She had a floodgate open up. She was so emotional at this time. It was just pouring out. She didn't need a basin to wash his feet. She didn't need a spigot. Her very tear ducts were providing plenty enough water to wash Jesus' feet. And she didn't even need a towel to dry them off because her hair was long enough that she used it to wipe them clean of all that dust and all that dirt. I believe she was just overcome with gratitude for what Jesus had done in her life. And it just broke down. And do you have to break down in tears to be grateful? No. But I believe you do need to have some emotion. Because God made us emotional beings. And maybe not all of us cry. Maybe not all of us share the same emotional outside, but we should for sure feel the same emotion inside that this woman feels when Jesus has saved us. It should stir us. Matter of fact, the Greek verbiage when it says here that she kissed his feet, if you study that word, it has to do with a continual act. She didn't just kiss. She kissed and 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 she kissed. She wouldn't stop kissing his feet because of her gratitude of what he had done. And then other places we see in Scripture that perfume was pretty expensive back then. Whether this bottle was or not, we're not giving indication, but whatever it cost her, she poured it on Jesus' feet. Now, if you've studied the love languages by Gary Chapman, we call them the love language, the love languages, the five love languages. But if you look at them, those are the same languages that you use to tell people thank you. What are they? Words. If you've done something for me that I'm grateful for, I can thank you by simply using the words thank you or whatever words come to my mind to thank you because of my gratitude. Another one of the love languages or what I would call also thank you languages are gifts. Now I can't tell you, hey, you gave me $15 and here's $15 back because I just nullified your gift for me and I paid you back. I didn't thank you and you'd be insulted. A lot of people say, please accept this as a token of my appreciation for what you did. You don't pay them back, but you just say, here's a gift. Another one is service. You may be so grateful for something somebody else did, you just said, hey, you just may go over there one day and mow the yard, or you may ask them to go somewhere with you or something, because you just want to show your gratitude in a service way. Another way is quality time. You just may want to spend some time with them to say thank you and be able to Take that quality time that you would not spend with somebody else, but with them. And then the other one would be touch. You may just be so grateful to somebody, you just give them a big bear hug and say, and not even say anything. And they know just by your hug that you're grateful. You know, a lot of people, you know, you, motivation for Christ has to come from the inside. You know, we could tell people, won't you be more committed to Christ? Won't you be more faithful? Won't you serve more? Won't you love more? Won't you be more on fire for the Lord? And You know, you just can't do that from the outside. That's something that has to boil up from somebody's inside. You can't make them do that. 
They've got to want to do that from the inside. And here we see in all this that this woman, it was coming from the inside. Her gratefulness, her gratitude for what Christ had done is just boiling over inside her because she loved what Christ had done for her. And then next, you always know that Satan has something to do with any time something's going good. You got the scoffer. Somebody's got to always spoil water on something going good. <laughs> Here's a lady not doing anything religious, but doing something spiritual. It says, now the Pharisee who had invited him, that's Jesus, saw this. Saw what? He saw this prostitute washing Jesus' feet. And he said to himself, remember he didn't have enough guts to say this out loud. He's just thinking it. And what is he thinking to himself? He said, if this man, that is Jesus, were a prophet, he would know who and what sort of person this woman is who is touching him that she is a sinner. Really. You know, the word Pharisee, which we know they were the religious leaders of the day, fasted regularly, faithful in the temple, faithful to the Old Testament, memorized scripture. The word Pharisee means separated one. Because that's really how they were. We were separated ones. Many of them self-righteous. Many of them proud and arrogant. Proud of their good works. Proud of their religious training. And many, if not most, probably felt no need for repentance and didn't view themselves as the sinner as they spoke of this woman. Matter of fact, it sounds as if Simon was absolutely embarrassed that such a woman would dare even come into his house at this event. And so what does he do? He points the finger and says, you know, if Jesus was such a prophet, he'd know that this woman touching him was a sinner. Well, little did he know, Jesus knew exactly who this woman was. He knows everything. He knew what her profession was. He knew what her sins were. You know what Simon should have said? He could have said this. She's a sinner just like I am. She's a sinner and she sins just like I do. She may sin in a different way and she may do different actions, but she is an equal sinner to me. You see, we failed to do that. Look at that old mass murderer sinner. When did God start saying that our sin's that great? Simon should have just said, man, she's a sinner, I'm a sinner, we're all sinners, we all need grace, we all need forgiveness the same way. My sin maybe not have gone that far, but that's only by the grace of God that my actions haven't because maybe his thoughts had, but he doesn't. You know, a lot of people can feel like they're growing spiritually and what they're doing, they're becoming more judgmental. See, sometimes spirituality, when it goes the wrong way, it develops itself into judgmentalness and self-righteousness. Well, look at those people, and I can't believe they do that, and that's not spiritual enough for me, and I wouldn't go to that because I'm too spiritual for that. And, and they think they're growing spiritually when they're going just the opposite way. Because true, true spirituality begins to look inside and say, man, the more I'm growing in Christ, the more of a sinner I see that I am. Oh, what a wicked man that I am. Isn't that what I, Isaiah, I mean, what the prophets would see? We'd look at our own life and not others. Man, the manager of a major league baseball team was so mad at the performance of his center fielder, he had him come into the dugout. He chewed him out. He said, you're about the sorriest center fielder this team's ever had. He said, matter of fact, I bet I could do as good as you do just as the manager of the team. So he grabbed his glove and ran out on the field, the manager, and took up center field. First ball came. 
hit the ground, popped up, and it ended up hitting him right in the forehead. Run scored. The next ball was a high fly. He lost it in the sunlight. It went over his glove and boom, hit him right in the eye. Boom, another run scored. The third one was a line drive and he thought he was going to catch this one and sure enough, it hit the very top of his glove and boom, hit him right in the mouth. Almost knocked his tooth out and another run scored. The inning was over. He ran to the dugout. He took his glove. He threw it on the ground. He ran over that center fielder and said, you idiot, you've got center field so messed up, I couldn't even do anything with it. <laughs> you know, that's how we are. We look at everybody else and what they do wrong and what they can do better and what they ought to do better and what you see they could do better and how can they can improve and how they ought to be more like you and more like me and God needs to judge us for being self-righteous just like this Pharisee. Instead of saying, man, I'm a sinner just like she is. But he couldn't see that. And that's why there's the dichotomy of these two people. I think the Lord's trying to show us which more are you like today? Are you more like Simon or more like the woman? We're going to see that he compares them even more throughout this story. And then we see the symbolism. Luke 7, 40, and Jesus answered him. Now, hold on. Answered him a what? Let's go back just a minute. I don't see a question. Do you see a question? Matter of fact, I don't even see anything here spoken out loud. How does he answer a question that's never been verbalized? Because Jesus reads the heart. See, Simon was saying this to himself, so don't think God doesn't know our thoughts. <laughs> and he's answering a question that Simon doesn't even ask. Because he's God. And he answers some questions in our life before we answer them. And Jesus answered Simon, I have something to say to you. I bet you do after what's just happened. And he replied, say it, teacher. Doesn't call him master. A money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. And they were unable to repay. He graciously forgave them both. So which one of them would love him more? Wow. I think that question came out of the left field but it didn't because he's trying to show a very important lesson to all of us a denarii was a day's wage it's what a worker during that society would earn in one day and so they understood it when he gave the illustration so let's say today let's say an hourly worker may work let's just give it a hundred bucks a day so if we use the hundred bucks a day illustration that meant the banker, the money lender, had loaned one guy $5,000 and he loaned the other guy $50,000. Because we know in the illustration, one is given 10 times as much money as the other. So he tells the $5,000 guy who couldn't pay the loan back, he tells him, your loan's forgiven. You don't need to pay any of that back. Then he looks over here at the $50,000 guy who can't pay his loan back and says, your loan is completely forgiven. Now, he asks Simon, which one of those two guys would love the money lender more? He's getting to the heart of the problem. Because then we get to the solution. Simon answered. I like to say Simon says. I just had to do that one. Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. The $50,000 guy would probably love him more because he got more money forgiven. And Jesus, he said to him, you've judged correctly. In other words, you gave the right answer. That's exactly the right answer. The one who was forgiven more money will obviously love more than the one who was forgiven little money. That's the solution. What solution? 
We just said if your spiritual get up and go has gone up and went, this is focused on the situation. You say, Brother Tim, you mean some people, their sins more than others? Is that what he's trying to teach? No. My sin, whatever degree it was, caused Jesus to die on the cross for my sins. And some guy in the penitentiary who's murdered 50 people, his sins were enough to cause Jesus to die on the cross. So in some sense, we've got the same amount. It's all perception, though. Jesus has done so much for me. I don't have to compare it to anybody else. My sins were wicked enough for God to die on the cross for me, and I'm grateful. Because then Jesus says in verse 34, turning to the woman, he said to Simon. So what is he doing? He's looking at the woman, but he's talking to Simon. He turns to the woman, but he's addressing Simon. And he tells him, do you see this woman? Kind of like, if you don't, why don't you look over here and look at her? I entered your house, and you gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. And you gave me no kiss, which was the greeting of the day, but she, since the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. She hasn't stopped. From the time I came in to this very moment, she's been kissing my feet the whole time. And you did not anoint my head with oil, which was customary for the day for a guest, but she, she's anointed my feet with perfume. See, he's trying to show the difference between Simon the religious man of the day, the most probably respected man in that society, probably the one of the most educated in the scriptures, the most loyal to be faithful in the temple, the most probably dedicated to the scriptures and its memorization, and compare that to the woman. And let's see how they stack up. No water for feet, washed with tears. Not a kiss at all. She hadn't stopped kissing his feet. Didn't anoint his head, didn't anoint his feet. And she's anointed his feet, not even with oil, with perfume. You know why he was still religious, but not loving Jesus? And why she was not religious, but loving Jesus? Because she was grateful for what God had done to her. And she wasn't looking like a lot of people say, Brother Tim, I just don't have anything to, to be able to serve the Lord with. I can't sing and I can't teach and I just don't have anything. This lady didn't answer that question. She said, I don't know what I got, but whatever I got, I'm gonna thank Jesus with. I got some tears, I got some hair, I got some perfume. That may be all I got because I don't know anything about the word. I've been a prostitute all my life, but I can do something to say thank you to Jesus. Isn't that what loving Jesus is all about? Is thanking him for what he's done. And this lady can't get over what he's done. And should we? Everything that she did, he didn't do. Everything that he should have been doing, he didn't do. And here's a woman who probably didn't know a scripture one. She wouldn't have known the book of Daniel from the book of Isaiah and probably couldn't even listed those two words. But she was thankful. She was grateful. Matter of fact, you know what the key is to enter God's gates? You want to get close to God? You want to enter his gates? Say, God's got gates? Well, my Bible says he does. It says, enter his gates. Empty-handed? No, you've got to get the key to get in the gate. You enter his gates and I enter his gates with what? Thanksgiving. That's how I enter his gates. I'm like this woman who's grateful for what he's done. Matter of fact, our anthem on Sunday morning as we seek to wake up to serve the Lord, to worship the Lord, may be this. I owe, I owe, off to church I go. 
You know what most people's cry is? I deserve, I deserve, so off to church I want to be served. I don't need to be served anymore. I've already been served by the Lord. It's just an act to be grateful and come to give. I've already received enough, thank you very much. Oh, Brother Tim, you got to? No, whatever he's given me is enough. You don't want any more? You don't pray for a certain thing? Yes, I do, but if none ever happened, if none ever came, what he's already given me is enough to praise him for till I die. Even just for savings enough. And so we see as this woman comes to Jesus and Jesus says this, for this reason, I say to you, her sins which are many have been forgiven for she loved much, but he who is forgiven little loves little. Where's the motivation come? If I've lost my spiritual get up and go, if I'm not faithful, if I'm not on fire for the Lord, if I ain't got any get up and go to my spiritual life, where's it all lie? Jesus said to me right here. He made it clear to me. You just love little because you think I've given little. You know, I think I would treat somebody different that says, Brother Tim, here's a piece of bubble gum versus the guy that says, Brother Tim, I've just paid off your car, your house, and here's a million dollars for retirement. And some people can treat Jesus like he gave a stick of bubble gum when he's given us his life. William Ward once said this. Feeling gratitude and not expressing gratitude is like wrapping a present and not giving it. Feeling gratitude and not expressing gratitude is like wrapping a present, but not giving it. Brother Tim, I feel a lot of gratitude for what Jesus has done. That's good. Let's kick that into gear. Let's express it. Because if I've done something for you, I don't know that you're grateful if you have to tell me. And if you've done something gracious to me, you don't know unless I tell you that I'm grateful or show you or do something for you. You don't know, I have to express it. Now, no way are we saying that this lady or us do things for Jesus so that he'll love us more. You can't do anything to make Jesus love you more. While I was yet a sinner, Christ died for me and you. I can't make him love me more or love me less. He's always going to love me. I don't do anything to make him love. This lady's not doing all this to make him love her or make him forgive her. And we can't do anything to pay him back. I mean, if you did something for me and I said, oh, here's that money for what you did for me, you'd be, that did insult you. And plus we can't pay him back anyway for what he's done. So we don't do it to make him love us. That's religion trying to earn God's love. And we can't pay him back, but we can thank him in an expressful way, in a love language, to say in our life that we appreciate all he's done. Remember the story of the 10 lepers? Remember 10 lepers, they begged for, I mean, having leprosy, that was a terrible disease. I mean, that was, you could, not only it was a bad disease and painful and infectious, I mean, it was, it was awful and there was no cure, but that wasn't even the worst part. You couldn't even be around your family and your friends and, and social activities or the temple or fellowshipping at parties or anything. You were isolated to just be around other lepers. So it was a terrible life. And so these men begged Jesus to forgive them, these 10 lepers. And so Jesus said, make your way and show yourself to the priest. And on their way, all 10 of them were healed. I mean, they started looking at their body and they're thinking, man, I don't have leprosy anymore. I'm healed. No leprosy at all. And one of those guys turned back around and headed back to Jesus and thanked him. And you know what, Jesus? Jesus answered, asked two questions that day, some of the best questions ever asked. You know what he said? 
Didn't I heal 10 men? Didn't I heal 10 men? And here's the second question that pierces the heart of everybody. Where are the other nine? Only one's come back to thank. <laughs> we found out later he was a Samaritan. One came back to say thank you. And Jesus is saying, I thought I healed 10. <laughs> Shouldn't 10 be back? Or if that's what he says at church and of service, didn't I save you? Didn't I die for you? All of you that claim to know me? Then he would say, where are the others? Aren't the others coming back to say thank you? Well, this woman did. She made sure. She made sure. A teenage boy wrote a note to his mom and left it on the breakfast table. She opened it and read it. It said this, Dear Mom, I realize how much I do around the house and I, don't th I think I should get paid because I deserve it. So the mom read it and then it said this, here is a list of the things I do and the charges for each. So mom read it and here's what it said. Mowing the yard, $20. Taking out the trash, $15. Washing the car, $10. Cleaning out the gutter, $8. Cleaning my room, $12. Total, $65. Signed, your son, Paul. Well, mama thought, well, I think I'll just write me a little letter of my own. And she did. And she left it for Paul. And it said this. Dear son, I read your letter. And enclosed is your money and a bill for my services that I perform for you. Cooking all your meals, no charge. Washing all your clothes, no charge. Staying up all night when you were sick and when you had that project at school to complete, no charge. For risking my life so that you might have life, no charge. Total free, done out of love. I wonder if Jesus may have written us a note if it may not say something like this today to the church and to each of his believers. Jesus might write something like this. For taking the crown of thorns on my head for you. No charge. For having my beard plucked from my face for you, no charge. For being slapped and spit upon for you, no charge. For having my back whipped until the flesh practically was taking off my back for you, no charge. For the nails that were driven in my hands and feet for you, no charge for dying on the cross so that your sins could be paid. No charge. Total, free, but it cost me my life. Sometimes we can slip into a, a non-grateful attitude. We can with our spouse. We can with our family. We can with our parents. We can with our church members. We can with our church and we can with our Lord. And it hurts every single relationship to the max. What does? Ingratitude. You show me a grateful person and I'll show you a happy, happy person. Because they're grateful for everything they receive. Instead of saying, I should have got a little more, I should have made a little more, you should have gave a little more, you should have did a little more, you should have put in a little more, you should have gave a little more effort. No, that's a miserable person. But a grateful person, they're happy because they feel like everything I'm getting is more than I deserve. 
Isaac Watt wrote the great hymn, When I Survey the Cross. What a great title for a hymn. What do you do when you survey the cross? What do you look at when you survey the cross, when you look at the cross? And I think Isaac Watt wrote, I believe, the best one-line chorus in any hymn in history, in my opinion. When he said this, were the whole realm of nature mine, that were a present far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. I don't know what more to say than that. I don't know what more to say. It demands everything. I have not enough to give him to say thank you. Thank you for my salvation. Thank you for every single thing he's ever given me. It demands my soul, my life, my all. And if my life doesn't have that get up and go anymore, I gotta look at two things. Either I need to get to the cross for the first time or I need to get back to the cross and say, God, you have been so good to me. And that's where the inner motivation comes. That's why you see people in love with Jesus, serving Jesus, happy with Jesus, because it's like this woman, not like Simon. He was religious, all right. He was faithful to church. He was faithful to religious activity, but he didn't have any spark. He didn't have any fire. He didn't have any motivation because religion wears off, but gratitude for Jesus doesn't. That comes from within. And I know that when my spiritual get up and goes, got up and went, it all goes back to what Jesus said right here. He who's been forgiven little, loves little. But he's been forgiven much, will love much. We go back to the cross and we see, God, how good you've been to me. And we look back at 2015 there's probably several instances where God saved your life, whether you recognize it or not. You may not even know he did, and he did. There may have been some things he kept from your life that until you get to glory, you won't even know what it was that he spared you for, from that you don't even know. And there's ways that you saw that he had favor shown upon you in a workplace, at home, kept you from something, blessed you in some way financially, physically, in some way. It just goes on and on. But we won't see it like Simon. But we will see it if we see it like this one woman who just gave Jesus what she had because she was so grateful. And the whole story focuses around her. Her name wasn't even given, but she was well elevated for what she did, an example for all of us. With every head bowed and every eye closed, as you stand to your feet, invitations pretty